Hella Black. Back at it, you know. Sparts of episodes coming at y'all, you know what I'm saying? So, appreciate y'all for supporting. Appreciate y'all being, uh, dropping comments, reposting, uh, sharing it. You feel me? Shout out to all the people who pulled over to the side of the road when they was listening uh, in their car and giving that five-star review. Appreciate y'all. Shout out to the uh, new patrons, you know what I'm saying? Get on board right now. Patreon.com slash Pie Support. Support the real. It's a lot of fake things going on. It's a lot of media wars going on. It's a lot of psychological terrorism operations going on through the media, uh, through Twitter, through social media. You feel me? We just trying to speak truth to the matter in the best way that we can. You know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. support Hell Black Podcast. Support the real. You feel me? We're trying to give this information uh, out as fast as possible and uh, be able to give it the proper historical context uh, so we can understand what's going on right now. You know what I'm saying? So. Tap in Hell of Black Pod, you feel me? SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast at, we is at, you feel me? But be sure to support patreon.com slash Hell Black Pod. Yeah, I echo the same sentiments around the gratitude. Uh, you know, I've seen some recent uh, comments and ratings on like our Apple and Spotify, so thank y'all. Uh, and I think this, I think all episodes are important, but uh, given the particular stage of the struggle uh, in Palestine uh, for their freedom, liberation, and sovereignty. I think it's important that you share this particular episode uh, with anyone who was trying to make sense of the uh, Palestinian situation. Um, Because like Abbas alluded to earlier, there's just so much information being pumped out. uh, And a lot of it has to do with uh, a lot of misinformation or the warping of facts to push forward the uh, agenda of U.S. settler colonialism uh, and the Jewish uh, settler state uh, that has been formed by genocidal uh, methods, right? And so we'll be talking a little bit about the history of the Zionist project, uh, its its historical development, uh, international law, and uh, we'll also be paying attention to what's going on in Haiti. I mean, it's just where right now we're dealing with a situation where all these contradictions of global uh, capitalism, right, imperialism are starting to reach a boiling point to where some categorical shift needs to needs to happen. Uh, And it's very hard. Even myself, I have a very hard time following everything. Um, And so what we're trying to do right now is make it easy for you. Um, And in the midst of all that's been going on in Palestine, the United States and the United Nations and other Western imperialist forces have been able to uh, push forward some racist, exploitative, neo-colonial, I would say, uh, initiatives as it refers to uh, Haiti. So we'll be diving into a little bit of the history of Haiti and what's set to happen uh, in 2024 based off a initiative uh, passed and backed by the United Nations Security Council. So... Um, hopefully y'all find this informative again this will be one of our i wouldn't say one of our one of our more brief episodes but we will try to be as concise as possible and we cannot give you the full historical and contemporary understanding of palestine uh israel the unjust state of israel uh haiti and united states western imperialism in an hour um just take this for what it is write down some of these facts and then go ahead and research um you know what we say so that you can come to conclusions by yourself that's what we want to do is just present objective facts that can help you make sense of uh the current climate and terrain and figure out what side of history you want to be on do you want to support israel united nations and united states or do you want to support uh the people who deserve sovereignty and freedom in palestine and haiti straight up you feel me it's important that we just get straight to the facts because <laughs> we ain't question. got no time to waste so we're gonna kick it off uh what is Zionism and what are some of like the, I know there's a lot, but like, I guess some of the key historical uh, factors you want to point to as to what got us to this moment right now? Yeah, I, I think this uh, this could be a whole 12 part series, really <laughs> diving sure. into the history of Zionism, uh, diving into the history of the so-called state of Israel, uh, diving into the history of the uh, terrorist forces um, of the Israeli occupation forces, also called the IDF, but uh, Zionism itself uh, is a racist, uh, fascist, anti-Islamic, settler colonial, uh, pseudo, pseudo-Jewish movement, uh, which seeks to establish a so-called uh, Jewish land, 
uh, in Palestine. But Zionism in itself uh, is anti-Semitic because it is not only killing Semitic people, but it is also killing Jewish people. <laughs> if we think about the uh, extermination uh, and the ethnic cleansing uh, attempts uh, to, to Ethiopian Jews, if we see uh, the Zionist attempts to and what they've done to uh, uh, Jewish people in Iraq. Uh, so Zionism itself uh, is anti-Semitic. It has no basis in the Torah. Uh, and it weaponizes uh, uh, the religion of Judaism uh, to serve the goals largely of Europe, <laughs> uh, largely of European Jews, right? Uh, not Jews or uh, indigenous um, to that area, but to the interests of Europe and European Jews, right? So I'd say it comes out, Zionism is a product of Europe. It's a product of pan-Europeanism, uh, it could have never been established without Europe, right? So we understand that uh, uh, Herzl, uh, Theodore Herzl, in the late 19th century, he founded it um, and wanted to have a, a, a Zionist land uh, for for Jewish people, right? So again, this is a a product of pan European Europeanism, but it's also a product uh, of Europe's problems on a multitude of fronts, uh, whether it be uh, Europe's you know uh, uh, hatred towards European Jews and wanting to, quote-unquote, deal with uh, European Jews, uh, as well as Europe's uh, economic <laughs> uh, imperialist interests uh, to expand, uh, as well as to combat the Ottoman Empire, to combat the, the larger Islamic world, you know? So uh, uh, Zionism was this uh, pseudo-movement uh, to essentially create a so-called uh, Jewish state, right? Uh, in the heart of Palestine. Um, it's a, a genocidal movement. It's a, a movement that is uh, ethnically cleansing uh, lands of Palestine, right? It's also something that is completely anti-African, right? So some people will be like, what does this have to do with us as African people, as new African people? Well, at first they wanted to literally install Zionism in Uganda, <laughs> Right. One of the Zionist Congresses was about getting uh, uh, the so-called state of Israel and installing it in Uganda. They also wanted to install it in uh, Eritrea. Right. <laughs> so it's inherently uh, anti-African, inherently anti-African uh, with goals of uh, dominating, <laughs> dominating West Asia, uh, installing a military hub, a social political hub uh, in West Asia. But also, if we look at a map, Palestine borders would. North the Africa. continent of Africa <laughs> borders Egypt, right? So even in this uh, war, within the first few days, we see the Zionist occupation forces uh, bombing Egypt, right? So again, it comes out of the the history of uh, British colonialism. Uh, So-called Great Britain uh, installed uh, installed uh, the Zionist nation of Israel, right? Uh, in 1882, the first Zionist colony was established. The Bal Balfour Declaration was in uh, 1917. In 1947, the United Nations uh, did the partition of Palestine. And then in 1948, the so-called uh, Zionist state of Israel uh, was created. It was created by with genocidal uh, imperialist tactics, uh, ethnic cleansing. Uh, the, the Nakba killed uh, nearly 100,000 Palestinians. Uh, nearly one million was displaced. Right. And, you know, these numbers uh, are estimates. Right. Because obviously we won't <laughs> know the full extent. Yeah. You know, uh, but this is what Zionism is. It's a uh, no religious base. It's an uh, interest of using, quote unquote, Judaism uh, t to subject the uh, the Muslim world uh, to the rule of pan-Europeanism. It's a pan-European project. You know, at the time when it was created, Great Britain was the top dog. So it was backed by Great Britain. Mm -hmm. Now in 2023, the top dog of pan-Europeanism is a so-called United States of America. That's why you see uh, Joe Biden with the uh, one signature giving $8 billion to the so-called state of Israel. That's why you see Joe Biden and Air Force One fly to the uh, occupied Palestine and be in the war cabinet uh, with uh, this terrorist named Netanyahu. Right. So this is. Uh, a product of Western shot callers uh, for their own material interests of pan-Europeanism, of this superstructure, uh, the superstructure of evil, uh, trying to dominate uh, the Muslim world, trying to dominate the Arab world, trying to dominate the African world, and put European rule at the top. Is 
I think that history is so important because uh, right now what's happening, we'll talk a little bit about uh, media and the role that it's playing in folks developing understanding and analysis, again, on the Palestinian situation. Um, there's this history of genocide that's being erased that is solely placing, uh, you know, Jewish Israelis in a state of victimhood when you recognize you uh, referring to an incident like the Nakba, which, you know, which uh, reportedly killed 100,000 100, 100, Palestinians, which, again, is just an estimate and displaced another million. Uh, but it's, it's very important that people recognize what, what's happening today uh, is a byproduct of a century plus of genocidal tactics against the Palestinians. Yeah. I mean, and this can go back, you know, even to these uh, uh, papal decrees mm -hmm. uh, by the Pope uh, saying we can uh, uh, enslave <laughs> the African world, enslave the Muslim world, right? Uh, it goes back to the uh, establishment of the, you know, the Catholic Church and uh, uh, the Crusades, right? Mm -hmm. So it goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, um, you know, um, but to focus on what's going on right now, this is a, a product of pan-Europeanism. This is Europe. <laughs> this is what the the evil forces of Europe uh, are doing to try and maintain control in the region. Joe Biden said, you know, if there wasn't an Israel, we'd have to create one. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, again, Zionism isn't, uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden himself, he said, uh, uh, I'm a Zionist. You know what I'm saying? You so don't have to be a, you don't have to be a, a Jew. <laughs> to be a Zionist. Uh, you don't have to be Jewish yeah. uh, to be a Zionist. Right. It's uh, we see plenty of uh, Western Christians. Uh, coinciding themselves or aligning themselves uh, with the Zionist movement. It's not a religion, you know? it's a political identity. It is, yeah. under the guise of religion, under mm -hmm. the guise of quote-unquote Jewish self-determination, -determ but that quote-unquote uh, pseudo-self-determination is at the expense of Palestinians, it's at the expense of Muslims, it's at the expense of creating a, a genocide uh, for indigenous Palestinians. Period, point blank, we must recognize the Jewish settler state. We must recognize the unjust state of Israel as a settler colonial project. Uh, it was about set colonizing land, uh, removing the population that was indigenous to that land, and forming a new society with the settlers by any means necessary. That's essentially, that's how you get the Nakba. <laughs> Period. I mean, the IDF was a terrorist. Like the foundation, the IDF it was terrorism. Mm -hmm. Stern Gang, Igran, and one more. It's like three fa three terrorist factions that created the IDF. It's boy so they're like all these calls of terrorism to me are just like who gets to define who's a terrorist? The terrorists <laughs> who terrorize the Palestinians are now determining that Palestinian resistance is terrorism. That's just like the kind of questions that mm -hmm. I ask myself. Like who gets to define this? Straight up. I mean, simply put, this is a genocide against Palestinians. And it's very simple to understand. It's those enacting genocide, which are the Zionists, the Israelis, the Europeans, and those experiencing genocide, the Palestinians. This I would ask, I would say that any person, any uh, person that finds themselves in this so-called state of the, uh, of the United States of America, if you can recognize the travesty <laughs> that happened to the folks indigenous to this land where you had... Uh, British settlers come over here, wipe out the population indigenous to this land and form a new society. How is that any different from what Israel is doing to Palestine? What's the difference? Settler colonialism. <laughs> what's, the, what's the difference? Huh. So this is, again, you must understand what's going on in Pal Palestine as settler colonialism. One point I do want to allow you to... Uh, I guess expand on before we go on to the next topic is now what about the religious element of this where you know people are able to hide behind it as a religious as a religious project where it's like okay well this is the land that was uh given to us based on our uh, religious religious heritage as it pertains to uh you know what's in the bible yeah i mean <laughs> uh this is just a complete distortion, right? Because if we if we look at you know the Torah and the story of uh, uh, Musa al-Islam, otherwise known as Moses, Moses, where was Moses coming from <laughs> historically? Right? He was coming from Africa. Mm -hmm. He was coming from from Egypt. 
We're talking about thousands of years ago. <laughs> Feel me? He's fighting against the uh, the Pharaoh, right? Yeah, Moses was African. He was described as black, <laughs> right? He was African, leading his people out of where Africa to try and find freedom, right? Uh, so that this pseudo basis uh, that they're actually in quote unquote direct <laughs> lineage, lineage <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, it just doesn't. I mean, Mo- Moses was African, and these uh, Zionists are European, right? Coming back to quote unquote saying that this is their land under the guise of a religious text that has uh, no historical basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, No historical basis for uh, a homeland of Israel uh, in Palestine, so-called homeland. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of Israel. Right. So understanding that that, uh, weaponizing um, and misunderstanding uh, (laughs) of uh, of the Torah to say that they is the, you know, uh, followers of Moses. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's this also it's this weaponizing of uh, this uh, spiritual Zion uh, with this quote unquote land, saying that it, it is land because in the Torah it forbids uh, it forbids quote unquote, uh, this this uh, type of uh, land, this nationalist project, right? Uh, so yeah, you see this just this complete weaponizing um, of, Ju- of Judaism, right? Uh, uh, what was the president, president Arafat? Uh, no, it was not Arafat. Um, Nasir in mm-hmm. Egypt. He said, you know, the Jews left Africa black and came back white. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, like, yeah. and if we look at who established Zionism, it was European. It was European Jews. Right? It was, it was was a Hungarian Australian. It was Hungarians. <laughs> it was Poles. Uh, it was Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, it was Russians. Right? Yeah. It was a product of Europe. It was what they call, quote, unquote, Ashkenazi Jews. Right, but also we understand that this pseudo European race science uh, being used used to uh, create this quote unquote uh, race of Jews. Mm-hmm. Uh, Judaism has no color. <laughs> you could be a black Jew, you could be a white Jew, you could be a brown Jew, you could be an Asian Jew. You know what I'm saying? Like, so we also got to understand where this uh, distortion of the religion is too, uh, and trying to make it a race. It's not. It's a religion. <laughs> Judaism is a religion. Christianity is a religion. Islam is a religion. <laughs> yeah. Right. So this, uh, yeah, this weaponizing uh, of it, but also you know we got to understand that uh, uh, a lot of Jewish people, you know, are, are completely against, uh, against it mm-hmm. because the rabbis are against it because they say it has no religious authority. You know what I'm saying? So you see uh, Orthodox Jews being. Uh, Completely anti-Zionist, saying that it, there must be the freedom for Palestine based off of the Torah, you know. So you see uh, the distortion used for the uh, uh, imperialist gains, uh, capitalist, uh, colonialist under the the pseudo guise of uh, religion. But you know, they is claiming to be you know the children of Israel. They mm-hmm. is claiming to be the quote unquote true Jews, right? So yeah. it is that a uh, uh, religious element that is at play for sure, right? Uh, so what would you say, you know, we understand that the media is <laughs> a way of psychologically controlling the masses uh, of people. So what role has Western media played in shaping opinions on Zionism uh, and the genocide in Palestine? I mean, me and you were literally just watching the news before we started recording this, and I was I was, as, I was saying how, you know, I, I don't expect... I haven't seen or I don't expect one Western media, you know, conglomerate or entity to actually speak on this thing objectively. Most of them are actually going to just push forward lies. And you were saying, like, I think you've seen one use some objective, objective truth, uh, maybe like MSNBC or some shit you were saying. But the rest, we could even use the example of uh, what happened with. Could have been MS, MSNBC. Yeah. No, it was, uh, you just it said was you one. saw one. Yeah, you saw I saw one, one. Right? <laughs> uh, out of however many. Uh, but the recent attack on the hospital where, you know, uh, you had different heads of state or different members of Israeli parliament speaking to uh, saying that, you know, this is the fight against light, the children of the light versus the children of the dark. And then the the, the bomb, the bombing happens at the hospital. Uh, you have different 
uh, Israeli, it seems like defense forces taking credit for the attack. And then once it comes out, like, yo, this is this killed 800 men, women, and children, 800 Palestinians. Now it's like, oh, actually, this was an attack by Hamas, right? Um, and then, you know, you have this, uh, we seen something that was like, okay, the NYPD is preparing itself for uh, uh, domestic attacks from extremist groups, uh, both that are pro 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 Hamas and uh, neo Nazi factions, which is insane because the United States just sent billions of dollars to the Ukraine in the Azov Battalion. Mm -hmm. Azov Battalion is what a neo Nazi faction. So it's like just the ability to warp and manipulate information at any given time, right? You had the Israeli Defense Force person with these with these uh d different diagrams and shit out. And for me, as someone who studied the history of the Black Panther Party, I recognize how uh, government agencies manufacture false evidence. At any given moment, they pay off scientists, they pay off photographers, they pay off forensics, they create these false diagrams. We've been seeing this since the beginning of time, for real, with, with, when it comes to the pan-European project, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And it's different domestic and international institutions. And so, yeah, you got you just have to take this with a grain of salt and you got to do your research. We were saying before how the average American worker don't have the time. They might have 20, 30 minutes at best to get it from their mainstream media outlets and Whether some of these smaller, the radio or listening to the you know, radio or watching the news in the morning. Like. And some of these smaller entities like a hella black or um, I listen to the geopolitical economy. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure they would never plug us, but it is what it is. Right. I, I do listen to these places to get some, I'm not going to name no more just for that person, <laughs> <laughs> just for that reason. And actually, mm, yeah, but you get what I'm saying? Like the, some of these smaller, uh, low independent, media outlets don't have the ability to produce the content and, and have it going 24 seven on these mm. global and national uh, syndicates. Right. And so um, you just get a lot of misinformation spread and there's a small amount of people who actually have the ability to be on Twitter all day and engage in what these small media entities are putting out. But I digress to your original point. I think uh, when it comes to the role Western media is playing in genocide, and shaping our shaping and giving people what to think about Zionism, you know, one could argue since Europe came in contact with Africa in the 15th century that they've been working, you know, overtime to cast Africans as dark savages. And you talked about Pope Alexander and his decrees, right, that gave uh, Spain and Portugal the right to go out and uh, quote unquote civilize the dark world, right? Um, the same philosophy exists today, uh, where you have Israeli government officials saying again, this is a fight between the dark and the light. Uh, but if we talk about the, the Zion, children of the you know what I'm the saying? Children of the light. Like was straight up though, like these are these are his words, right? But if we talk about the Zionist genocidal genocidal uh, settler state of Israel, uh, it was founded on propaganda. We talk about Theodore Herzl. One of his first uh, like statements in the early 20th century um, was him saying that like yeah, uh, in addition to our religious right to this land, our pseudo religious right to this land, uh, pa Palestine doesn't have any people. Like literally, the, the people don't exist there. The, the the folks that are there are nothing but uh, petty farmers with no real agriculture and civilization. So we will be doing them a favor, and we are letting all this fruitful and fertile land go to waste, right? Uh, and we know that that was a lie, right? Uh, the Gaza port was a central port that connected Palestine to shit the entire world. We know that Palestine was trading with China was trading with different parts of Africa, was even trading with parts of Europe, right? So you present it as this place of savages with no, with, with no, um, no civilization. That is part of the propaganda that allows you to go invade and install your set of colonies. So we see this happening in the 20th century. We see it happening now, right? Uh, and so, yeah, with that lie, you know, we see the early sentiments of Palestinian life and people uh, being reduced to nothing in rhetoric, but soon to follow in practice, right? Uh, and I, you know, we talk about this all the time. The biggest shift that we've been able to see as it pertains to the war on Islam, the war on the Middle East, um, West Asia, North Africa is post 9 11, right? Where all the movies, the games, the television is showing you what? Tau head extremists. That's what they want to, that's what they want you to view them as. You feel me? Um, what was Arab this, extremists? Yeah. What was terrorists. his last Call of Duty? <laughs> what are all these movies coming out? What was that? Uh, and one of them Tom told me they could kill Soleimani. Yeah, Call of Duty. And then, then they just then you just told me they bombed the statue of Soleimani. This isn't is this supposed to just <laughs> random? But that's what they want you to. They want you. They want you to hate. It's the same thing they do to us though, right? What happened with Trayvon Martin? They put him on TV with with uh, with a toy gun. Mike Brown, thug. 
You feel me? Like this is this is what they do. They create these narratives that justify what's about to happen to them. Let me show you what if they don't if you we don't do this to them, this is what's gonna happen to you. It's always that like that 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 creating that fear of the Arab world. That's that's what that's what Western propaganda does. It wants you to justify what's about it wants you to justify the bombings, right? It wants you to justify the displacement. It wants you to justify the pseudo evacuations. You call somebody an hour before, right? Quote unquote, the IDF gave them a heads up or whatever. Huh. We, you need to evacuate. How do you evacuate millions of people? How? How do you evacuate millions of people? You evacuate people who are in critical condition. Nigga, they couldn't even evacuate the city of New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina came. They, they, they chose not to. So can you feel me? Like, these are the type of questions that we have to ask ourselves. And so, Western media is playing a key role because what? Western media doesn't want you to think for yourself. It's going to use certain language to uh, build certain emotional responses to you. Uh, and of course, man, like, I can't think of no human in their right mind that isn't set back from death. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, people, you tell people, like, terrorists blew up a hospital, terrorists did this, uh, people gonna, gonna feel away, gonna be hurt, right? But without the historical context of what Palestinians, what Palestinian people have been through, without understanding that this nation, when it was first projected as a project in the 1890s, that it laid the foundation and the rhetoric for mere violence, the fact that you say these people do not exist in fact, they have been there for centuries, right? This is just how we get to where we are right now, where you get Floyd Mayweather saying, I don't think his is a lack of knowing. I think, you know, Zion has cut his check. I'm about to give him $50 million, and I'm sending him, you know, uh, I'm sending my private jet full bulletproof vest. This is where we get LeBron James, right? Uh, this is where you get, I was telling you earlier, Nate Burleson. I don't know Nate Burleson from a can of paint. I used to, you know, I play football. I watched a lot of football. I know he played wide receiver. Why is Nate Burleson speaking on the Palestinian situation. You think he really has an analysis or do you think the producer wrote his script and he's reading off a teleprompter? You know, Jaleel just said he wanted to debate somebody. Look, I don't know a lot about the Palestinian situation more than I just know what I'm speaking to right now, but I guarantee you on live television I'll run Nate Burleson into the ground. <laughs> no teleprompters. No notes. We can only go off what we know. You feel like, I digress. The point is, this is what Western media does, and yeah. you gotta have these facts, man. That's why uh, El Haj Malik El Shabazz said the media is the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty and to make the guilty innocent. And that's what we're seeing right now. We're seeing uh, this is a part of war. That's what this media is doing right now. This is a part of war. This is psychological operations. Uh, towards the masses of people to demonize uh, the Palestinians, to demonize the people who are experiencing genocide and to uh, promote uh, fascism, to promote uh, this racist uh, Zionist project of Israel and give Israel the quote unquote impunity to be able to do whatever it wants, right? And uh, also what they're doing is this very, they're trying to make it seem like uh, Muslims is Nazis, right? That's what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But the real thing is these Zionists, <laughs> these Zionists are. These Europeans are, right? Is the Europeans who did the Holocaust. And now they're trying to conflate that with what's happening right now in terms of uh, Palestinians resisting. So this is part of the, the media war that's happening. <laughs> the complete media war where it's saying, oh, okay, uh, these Muslims are the terrorists, right? These Muslims are partnering with, or, or, or the far right, but in reality, mm -hmm. Zionism is the far right. It is the extreme right. Yeah. Imperialism is the extreme right. Zionism is fascism. The United States of America is a fascist empire. Mm -hmm. That's what's fascist. So we, we just got to understand it for what it is and not uh, be fooled uh, by these psychological mind games that they're playing on us. And uh, they know their days is numbered. <laughs> They know their days is numbered because uh, the youth are no longer falling for this. Mm -hmm. No longer falling for it. The youth know what's going on. Yeah. The youth be doing investigative journalism. <laughs> the youth be understanding these things on social media and be pointing to all the holes and got the screenshots, got the quote unquote receipts. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You can't fool the conscious. One, one last thing I want to say before we get into the next question is I keep seeing this quote from James Baldwin being posted around where he's like, uh, you know, Europeans feel bad for what happened to 
uh, Western Europeans feel bad about what's happened happened to Jewish people, so that's why they came up with the with the Jewish settler state. And you know, I would assume that I would hope that James Baldwin was talking about the average white citizen, European citizen, who's like, yeah, the the uh, Holocaust happened, and you know, there should be reparations for what happened to these people. But nigga, the United States government, NATO, the IMF, and the World Bank do not feel sorry about what happened to Jewish people. They are going to... The Jewish settler project is an economic project when it comes for NATO. And part of it is, again, their uh, religious crusade and their actual hate for the dark world. But at the core of it is natural resources. So this is what I want to talk about, right? Because many people get lost on the, I think, like the humanist element of it, which is important, right? But at the end of the day, what, what America moves on is money, right? Uh, so uh, what are the geopolitical implications... Of the unjust state of is of, of the unjust state of Israel, right? Understanding that they have a very large economy, you know. Um, yeah, so, what are the geopolitical impl- implications of this situation, and what should people? Yeah, I'm gonna start with that. We'll do the next part after. Well, the state of Israel is one that uh, is occupying uh, the resources of Palestine. Uh, they're occupying the land of Palestine. They have complete. Uh, economic control of even what gets in and out of Gaza, right? Uh, so it's it's a state of a, a settler colonialism, and Israel itself uh, it's one of the biggest producers of technology in the world, right? So if mm-hmm. we think about like these Pegasus systems uh, that install spyware into the iPhones that uh, allow you know European intelligence agencies to spy. Uh, we think about even the so-called Iron Dome system, right? The military technology, right? So uh, that is a, that you know uses uh, AI to be able to track incoming uh, uh, mortars or uh, missiles and be able to strike them down, right? So Israel is a, a technological hub uh, for the West, right? The technology that it develops. Uh, it exports uh, to the European market, to the uh, pan-European market. Uh, it's also in the heart of uh, uh, North Africa <laughs> and West Asia, right? A very significant uh, geopolitical location uh, for the world, like you were talking about earlier, right? The essential uh, trade routes uh, historically uh, of the ports, right? Uh, the access that uh, having a military outpost, a, a militarized nation, because that's what uh, Israel is. It's a <laughs> militarized nation. That's what it's a military outpost to where every uh, settler is, you know, a part of the military. They have to do military service, right? So it's a military outpost uh, in the region where Israel is now the biggest exporter of terrorism, right? Uh, we know that. Uh, Israel, the Zionist regime, uh, exports terrorism to these uh, uh, so-called uh, jihadi groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda, and providing funds directly to them. Um, and you know, we've seen what they've done in Iraq. We've seen what they've uh, done uh, in Syria. We've seen what they've done uh, in East Africa. We've seen what they've done in West Africa. Right. So this is um, part of this geopolitical. Uh, a factor that Israel is playing within the region. It's an exporter of terrorism. It's an exporter uh, of evil, right? Uh, it allows the United States uh, to be able to be like, oh, you know, our hands are off of it. This isn't us. Um, but then allow Israel to do uh, some of the dirty work of pan-Europeanism uh, within the region, right? So Israel is meant uh, as a military, uh, economic, uh, political structure for the West, uh, in the heart of West Asia to be able to uh, enact uh, the rule of pan-Europeanism, right? To be able to, uh, quote-unquote, have these ties with uh, these, you know, nations uh, within West Asia, right? These normalizations deals with, quote-unquote, Saudi. Uh, these normalization deals with uh, the UAE, right? These normalization deals with Kuwait. These normalization deals uh, with Sudan to allow... Uh, pan-Europeanism uh, to be able to uh, export itself while also uh, having this larger war against the Islamic world. So these are some of the uh, uh, geopolitical factors um, that you know led to the West supporting, creating, and continuing to support uh, the state of Israel. But what is happening right now is that the masses of people, it's a mass awakening 
uh, a mass awakening of the, of the Muslim world, of the, the Arab world, of the African world, right, to where uh, the masses of Muslims are rising to the streets. Because one thing, two things Muslims unite on is Ramadan, <laughs> is Ramadan and, and Philistine, Palestine. Right. Uh, so we're seeing these nations like Saudi that had normalization deals in the works uh, with the so-called state of Israel. Now they're saying, oh, this is gone. We, we can't normalize anymore. We're seeing uh, uh, Muslims in Jordan uh, rise up against American interests within their country. We're seeing Muslims in Lebanon rise up against American interests in their country. We're seeing Muslims in Iran rise up uh, against these embassies, that uh, these European embassies in, in their land. Uh, so we're seeing this uh, revivalism of a, like an Islamic awakening uh, of the masses of, of Muslims of the masses of the Arab world saying no to pan-Europeanism and protesting uh, this unjust state. So that's why I say it's not a matter of uh, if, Palestine will be free. It's a matter of when. And the masses of people are awakening, are rising up uh, to remove uh, this Western parasite uh, from their region. What we try to do is always give folks action. I think we're giving a lot of historical <laughs> understanding, a lot of analysis. But like, what would you say people can do to actually support Palestinians fight for liberation? Because I do see a lot of value in the protests, but we're not too far removed from the protests of 2020 where the calls for defund police uh, were excuse me, running throughout the nation. But here we are in 2023 again, and Cop City in Atlanta is about to be built. They're beginning to build a large training facility in San Pablo here in the Bay Area uh, for pigs. And we know that OPD's budget has increased every year, and nationally the police have killed more people every year since 2020. So uh, protests have some impact in, as it pertains to raising awareness, but we know that there has to be some sort of action that follows through to actually build a movement that can be, uh, you know, a decolonial movement. Yeah, that's, that's a great question because we have to understand history. <laughs> we have to understand history of movements, what those movements led to, uh, how movements worked, how they didn't work, uh, what failed, why they failed, uh, and how to have a proper political strategy uh, for movement to work, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about uh, Palestine that is backed by pan-Europeanism and the top dog of pan-Europeanism is the United States of America, and then the United States of America got all of its wealth uh, through exploiting the African, through enslaving the African, through genocide towards the African, uh, and all of the wealth of this nation, which allowed it to become an imperialist nation, was built off of the African and the genocide of the indigenous. Right. So if we have that historical understanding uh, of the way that the United States of America grew into an empire, then it allows us to have a proper historical understanding and be able to develop a, a theoretical position and put that theoretical position into practice uh, based off of understanding the historical development of the USA. If the USA was founded off this genocide of Africans, and then it's allowed to do this imperialist uh, uh, control of the world, then how do we stop the United States of America, right? How do we stop uh, the USA from giving billions upon billions of dollars to the unjust state of Israel? How do we stop the United States of America from giving weapons of mass destruction to this is the state of Israel? That means we must struggle here. We must develop revolutionary organizations, revolutionary cadres here in the United States of America inside the belly of the beast that can uh, successfully, uh, you feel me, like George says, uh, stop imperialism, imperialism at home uh, so that the world isn't subjected to nuclear warfare. Because people talk about Israel, but people don't be talking about how they have nuclear bombs. <laughs> people talk about Europe, but people don't be talking about how Europe got nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. People talk about America, but don't be talking about how America got nuclear bombs. This is what we're talking about here, right? <laughs> so how do we prevent this, right? So we, this protest needs to turn into programs. This program, you know, it has to turn into revolutionary organizations that have real objectives, right? Because I know it can feel good going out and yelling at people and doing this, right? But if that uh, mobilization uh, isn't then funneled into revolutionary organization, and then revolutionary organization must have a program attached to it to, to develop consciousness, to develop the uh, autonomous infrastructure of becoming our only breeders. If we don't have that material basis, 
uh, we're going to see ourselves continue to go on this circus wheel, continue to be killed, continue to be exterminated, genocides continue to be committed. And what are we doing besides just protesting and yelling? You feel me? And having these emotional reactions, right? We have to have direct action. There needs mm -hmm. to be uh, mass strikes. You know, this economy needs to feel it. You know, uh, if we're talking about uh, uh, direct actions that need to be done. You know, like why, if we say we as anti-Zionists, then how are we going to shut down some of these Zionist corporations? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we say we as anti-Zionists, how are we going to uh, stop the United States of America from giving our tax dollars that we work hard for and that we're forced and subjected to pay to give to Israel? Why is that happening? You feel me? So there has to be a, a mass movement, a mass movement that is also bound by ideology. Because there ain't no movement without ideology. You're just going to have people uh, <laughs> just walking in whatever direction thinking they're doing it for freedom. So we got to be strategic. <laughs> uh, we have to be strategic, you know. And one thing is we see this as a, as a global movement. <laughs> It got to be seen as a global movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be connected uh, to movements across the world, right? Because we understand that uh, oppression anywhere uh, is oppression, and oppression is always connected. If we understand this pan-European nation, uh, pan-European project as a global project, as an imperialist project, then we got to understand we got to attack it on multiple fronts. And there's multiple fronts right now. There's uh, fronts in the Sahel and West Africa, right? Uh, and there's fronts in Haiti, mm -hmm. right? So thinking about what's going on uh, in Haiti, you know, to just transition, transition a little bit, um, but to also show the connections, uh, especially if we're thinking about the United Nations role in the, in the partition of Palestine, the United Nations role in not having a ceasefire or of not uh, holding these Zionists accountable to war crimes, to international war crimes. Uh, but yeah, well, what's uh, happening and how did we arrive this at this point uh, in Haiti? I mean, what we're seeing right now, uh, what we're seeing happen in Haiti right now is all a byproduct of uh, neocolonialism, right? Where you have these monopoly capitalists, these these elites, these corporations, backed by international institutions like NATO and the UN, they are looking uh, to establish a new set of relations with Haiti, right? Uh, so because of this desire to have a new set of relations, economic relations, political relations, uh, the UN has just backed a quote-unquote uh, Kenya-led invasion of Haiti when all signs point to this invasion actually being led by the United States. I mean, the United States themselves have come out and said, uh, we are going to take the lead on this. We will take the logistical and administrative lead on this. That means we will supply ammo, we will supply travel, and we will supply um, on the ground, shit, military uh, advice, right? Uh, and so uh, they had to, but what they had to do is put Kenya in the lead uh, to put a black face on it because the last few United States invasions have gone so poorly, whether you're talking about 1994 or Operation uh, Uphold Democracy by the Clinton administration or the recent invasion in uh, 2004, uh, which was UN backed uh, and following a coup that many people believe the United States uh, played a role in, right? And these invasions of Haiti in 1994 and 2004 have all these reports of just lawlessness by United States military, right, in terms of killing, uh, abusing, raping uh, Haitians, right? And so with this uh, history, with this understanding, the United States of what? They're going to just stay military, they're going to just stay tactics. We can't, we can't go. Let's put Kenya, a country that is billions and billions and billions of dollars in debt, to the United States, a country who is, uh, has done, has taken many reactionary political stances against some of the more uh, recent coups, whether they be in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, right? Let's make these people the head of it, right? Because most humans still follow the reactionary race and ethnical uh, take that all skin is kin or that all Africans have the interest of Africa, the best interest of Africa uh, as their philosophy, that being an African head of state automatically makes you a pan-Africanist, right? Um, when we are being a member of the African Union automatically makes you a pan-Africanist, right? Uh, and so the United States and Western imperialist powers understanding this, they put Kenya at, at the forefront of it. Um, and so with this current invasion, they're saying that they're going to 
help the government of Haiti fight back against quote unquote gangs, right? Um, first of all, the people of Haiti have already come out and said that the current government does not represent them, which makes sense uh, when you realize that the U.S. helped install, uh, I think it's Ariel Henry, uh, after the ins- assassination of like Jovel Mosey, Jovenel Mosey, I don't know how to pronounce his name. He was a, a, a neo-colonial fascist anyway, so deaf to bruh. You feel me? It is what it is. Um, I really don't need to know your name. But they re- the U.S. replaced uh, the assassinated president with Henri. There was no, even after all these different Haitian organizations and civil groups came out and was like, look, we have a two-year plan, a two-year plan to uh, recover from this assassination and put in an elected democratic official, elected, elected, elected uh, parliament. The U.S. said no and installed Henri, Right. So you're going to help a government that the people have come out and said doesn't represent them in order to uh, help this government fight back against gangs. When many of the people in Haiti have already reported that some of these gangs are just a byproduct of oligarchies, right? Uh, creating these gangs to uh, push forward their imperialist desires, their finance capital desires, right? Uh, it's, form, it's just like the IDF claiming that Hamas is terrorists. How can terrorist groups define other terrorists? It's just the backwardness of it all. But again, backwards. What was it calling the party? A gang. You know, like the OPD calling and somebody I, a terrorist? You feel me? Come on, like, what, what are we what talking, talking about? about? <laughs> but this, is what, this is the situation, right? And so again, it's important that we recognize this all being a byproduct of neocolonialism. Uh, and again, them saying that they are going to go and support democracy in Haiti when Haiti already had their own plan for democracy and getting an uh, elected government in place and the U.S. saying, no, we want Henri in place uh, following a coup that they helped install, right? Uh, with well, this is important information and again it's imperative that we note that all this civil and national unrest is the byproduct of the super exploitation of Haiti since the 17th century since the Spanish uh, succeeded the colony to the French uh, it set this reality in motion right uh, but the Haitians have always resisted you know that's important for new Africans to understand for Africans everywhere to to understand Haitians have always existed right uh, home of the first successful slave rebellion right uh and i encourage people as the first place the first nation to permanently ban hate to permanently ban slavery and i encourage mm-hmm. people to check out two books one is uh a history of pan-african revolt right black jacobins too right yeah that was, yeah. That was the deal. a history of pan-african revolt and black jacobins both written by clr james check out those two books if you want to understand a little bit more the second one black jacobin goes into detail of the haitian revolution led by two saint levator and Dessalines, right Uh, But again, the Haitians have always resisted Uh, from 1791 to 1804. You know, you first being led by Toussaint Louverture, who was assassinated, and then being uh, led by Jean Jacques Dessalines. Uh, And since they've established the free nation, they've been fighting off imperialism, right? Even in the uh, early 19th century or in the 19th century, when you have Thomas Jefferson uh, installing an embargo on them. This is the 19th century. Installing an embargo because the, the, the slaves freed themselves and began to govern themselves. Is where you have the United States. The United States has been tampering with Haiti's sovereignty since the free nation was established in 1804, right? And then uh, in the 19th century, again, you have the King Charles X of fucking France uh, sending his navy over there and saying, we want reparations. We want reparations. So we have the Western world has always been toiling, exploiting, peddling, and pillaging uh, They always want to play victim. Always want to play victim. So we trust they get these to people? pillage the world. Come on. They get to enslave the world. They get to steal the world's resources. And then when the chicken comes home to roost, they get to define terms of war and say, "Oh no." <laughs> or they get to determine they <laughs> you know get, these are the people who supposed to give aid. Not so. And you supposed to trust them. We are supposed to trust these. You feel people. me? So now we owe you quote unquote reparations after you did this to us. And this is, part, but this is a, again, this is a part of the way of like going back to like this is the the framing of things. Yeah. yeah. This is the history that they don't this give the you history. when they talk about exactly. the UN invading, the US invading, Kenya invading. They don't give you this history of what has led to all mm-hmm. this civil unrest, the embargoes of the 19th century, the uh, invasions of 1915, the invasions of 1914, uh, the, of 1994, the invasions of 2004, these coups backed by the US, right? So for centuries, uh, Europe and America have been on a mission to destabilize, extort, and exploit Haiti and the Plan, 2004, plan 2024 invasion is... Just another example, period, point blank. You gotta look at the facts for what they are. (laughs) 
gotta get gotta look at the facts and based on this history again of Haiti, this is something that we should be keeping our eyes on. Uh, because just a lot like uh the unjust state of Israel, uh there are geopolitical ramifications. And so my question is, what is Haiti's relevance to the geopolitical arena as it pertains to neocolonialism? Yeah, well, it's always been relevant, but I would say uh, Europe and pan-Europeanism, uh, Haiti has always resisted, like you were saying. They have always resisted. They have always resisted, which is uh, not allowed Europe, essentially, uh, to put Haiti in a chokehold, right? So if we look at it from a lens of like the natural resources, uh, Haiti has some of the biggest uh, bauxite res reserves, <laughs> right? Bauxite that makes aluminum. Bauxite that makes these computers. Bauxite that makes these cars. Bauxite that uh, makes these microphones. Bauxite that is literally used and is going to be used more and more, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it has approximately two billion two billion tons of reserves, right? And we see just especially with the shifting uh, global market, the shifting of this quote unquote green capitalism. You feel me? Mm -hmm. uh, we see this material being used and needed to be used more and more, right? Uh, it got hella land, <laughs> hella land. You feel me? In terms of uh, like arable land, right? Land that can be used for coffee, sugar cane, rice, and beans. It got copper, calcium carbonate. Uh, gold, you feel me, uh, the potential for hydropower, right? So we're seeing what I would say Haiti is the world's poorest country. Uh, but if you look at its size, it's extremely resource dense. Uh, the ability to produce capital is huge in Haiti. And I would say it's a untapped, a quote unquote untapped resource for the West, right? So as we see these shifts uh, with these economic superstructures, with the development of BRICS, uh, we see these wars happening right now um, in West Asia uh, and the U.S. funding these wars. Right. We see uh, these war in Ukraine and the United States uh, funding the Ukrainians. Uh, and the, again, going back to BRICS and the shifts in the economic superstructure, America is like we need to make our money. Right. For the for the economic aspect, we need to make our money and you have a untapped, uh, untapped market. Right. Uh, if you look at uh, the company called Alcoa, it's a major U.S. based aluminum company. Right. <laughs> they have been entered into contracts uh, with Haiti. Right. Uh, Jovenel Morse. I don't know how I did with the pronunciation. Well, yeah, it's, it's probably some French shit, so you know, um, he had a close relationship with Alcoa Corporation. Right. Uh, in 2017, he signed a new agreement with Alcoa that extended the company's mining lease in Haiti for 25 years. Right. So the U.S. always will show what its interests are and why it's doing what it is doing. And if we look back on it, you know, it's, it's the corporate interests of the United States of America. We understand the United States of America is a corporate government. So it has corporate interests. Right. Uh, if we also look at the strategic location of Haiti as well, uh, from a military perspective, mm -hmm. what's its neighbor? And what, you know, what war, you know, what uh, is, is his neighbor relationship with the United States of America? If we look at Venezuela, <laughs> right? So again, it gives uh, a, a military tactical advantage uh, if the United States determines it wants to go at war with Venezuela, which you know uh, it's organized uh, backdoor coups, trying to uh, it's organized pseudo presidents, <laughs> right? And if we know Venezuela, Venezuela is a you know a, a nation that is aligning itself with oppressed nations, you know, throughout the world, right? Um, as well as, you know, if we connect it kind of to what's going on in, uh, if we do connect it to what's going on in West Asia, uh, Iran has relationships with Venezuela, <laughs> right? They fear that, uh, the deepening ties between Iran and Venezuela, uh, will have major, uh, impacts on, on the United States, right? Uh, when the United States of America launched, uh, electronic warfare against Venezuela and shut down, um, some of its critical in infrastructure, uh, you know, it, there there was uh, alleged reports that Iran, uh, you know, sent some of its forces uh, in terms of like its uh, uh, nation nation uh, like the the people who work within his nation sent some of its uh, like aid to Venezuela to be able to help fix some of the uh, the issues that they were having in their country. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, again, it's the military significance of where, the geopolitical significance, the uh, geographical <laughs> significance, as well as uh, America's addiction to killing the dark world, to exploiting the dark world, uh, to enslaving the dark world, uh, because pan-Europeanism is a evil and it has a, a satanic element to it. thousand percent. Understanding history, because Western media will make you seem like this thing just happened at random, like it came out of some vacuum, or it's only been uh, reduced to, you know, the last few generations of struggle. What we're talking about here is centuries-long problems, whether we talk about uh, Palestinians, uh, neo-colonial subjugation, or whether we're talking about Haiti's neo-colonial subjugation, and they fight against Western imperialism. It goes back centuries and centuries and centuries. And what we can do is understand our history and then struggle day to day uh, to put the morals, philosophies, and political practices of uh, communal and egalitarian principles into life. That's, that's, that's what we can do. And struggle, really try to, what does it mean to struggle against the West where you are? To struggle against these philosophies, ideologies, and practices. For us, it's uh, decolonization programs. programs, you know. <laughs> so if you in the Bay, come get involved with People's Programs. Peoplesprograms.com, you feel me? Tap in with us. Uh, we hope y'all got uh, uh, understanding. You know, again, like we said in the beginning, it's only so much we can do uh, in 56 minutes of a podcast episode in terms of uh, two very significant uh, locations in the world, Palestine and Haiti, you know, and what's going on uh in the respective locations, you know, so we uh, encourage y'all to do more studying, do more reading, uh, and appreciate y'all for tapping in.